Welcome to Flip the Switch, a podcast by Global Energy Alliance for people and planet. In this podcast, we're talking about financial innovations, driving global optimism for a cleaner, greener, and a better future. And to talk about this in detail with us, we have Mr. Vikram Singh, Senior Principal, Senior Program Director, Global South RMI, and Ria Saxena, Senior Associate RMI. Thank you so much for joining us, for giving us your time, and welcome to Flip the Switch. Thank you so much <laughs> for the invitation, Aditi. It's a great pleasure to be here with my colleague, Ria. And we, of course, you know, want to acknowledge the generous support of GAP uh, as a great partner throughout the world uh, in the work that we do. Well, RMI is known for all the work around clean energy and sustainable development. So I'm going to straight dive into the question. And the first one is for you, Vikram. Could you tell us about any innovation or any specific project in this area that RMI is involved with right now? Yeah, in many ways you could argue we invented the field. Uh, our founder, Amory Lovins, uh, was the first to come up with this idea of distributed renewable energy uh, over 40 years ago, back when we were known as the Rocky Mountain Institute. We have since rebranded and undergone significant changes as RMI. Uh, we have grown threefold over the past several years, now operating globally uh, and you know, making quite an impact. Uh, we've taken our brand and been able to make significant changes. Today we're here, of course, to celebrate the launch of our market, market action report for accelerating battery energy storage in India. You know, really laying down the pathway for going from a near, near zero uh, to almost 40 gigawatts of, of battery energy storage in India within the next seven years. And in this way, India is being used as a platform and a model for the rest of the world in terms of what, what is doable. We've also been uh, quite, quite uh, impactful in India uh, with our support of, uh, through the support of Niti Aayog uh, in uh, electric vehicles. Uh, and you know, those are now representing about 50% uh, of vehicles around the world in terms of two and three wheelers. Uh, we've had a significant impact with our Shunya initiative, again led by Niti Aayog. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, with in the financial sector, which we're here about to, to talk about today, we've uh, seen that you know through our work with climate finance, about three quarters of the world's financial institutions are now have credible transition plans. So we see ourselves as making uh, uh, quite an impact across a number of fronts, and it's a pleasure to be here to talk about that. Thank you so much for all that you are doing. And I have to say, both the older name and the new name, I think they're very, very cool. <laughs> yeah, one of the coolest names, of course. Now, th for the second question, I would want uh, answers from both of you, but probably, Ria, you could go first. Uh, we're seeing a lot of growing optimism around climate finance. Uh, could you think of reasons? Could you share reasons why do you think that is happening? And also, how is this uh, optimism, you know, how has it evolved in recent years? Thank you for that question, a very relevant one. I think in the last, uh, I would say the last few years since the pandemic, the conversation around climate finance has significantly picked up. Uh, if you see at a global south level, there's a lot of unified voice that's being represented uh, by a number of initiatives such as Bridgetown and others that are talking about creating more space and financing for uh, opportunities around climate related sectors and emerging risks that are associated with it in the global south. Uh, there's also a lot of focus and emphasis, I would say, on seeing how multilateral development institutions can start moving towards more rapid deployment of capital for climate-related projects. And you see some of this positive momentum you know, coming out with the World Bank taking reforms and initiatives, uh, with the ADB taking additional initiatives and steps. And there's a lot of conversation that's actually garnered uh, the momentum and the pulse of the market uh, driving this optimism around climate finance. And um, if I were to talk about you know, some of the specifics of what we've seen in countries such as India, uh, the government is playing a significantly large role. You know, they're acting as an enabler. Uh, the Reserve Bank of India, the Securities Exchange Board of India, they've laid out a number of enabling policies, uh, a number of nudges to push your corporates, your financial institutions to move ahead towards uh, being more cognizant and taking actual action around climate finance. So be it the sovereign issuance, 
by the government of India that's come out more recently, be it a number of directives around green bond issuances that have come out and are nudging more work in the space. Uh, so the policy environment is good. The business environment for opportunities, uh, you know, like Vikram was mentioning, mobility, uh, they're really becoming real business opportunities to capitalize on. Mm -hmm. uh, the solar sector has seen so much of business growth as well, uh, the utilities specifically. So there's an actual enabling regulatory environment along mm -hmm. with business environment that's driving some of this ahead. And uh, to take some of this momentum ahead as RMI, uh, you know, we've seen some really powerful initiatives at the institute level, uh, things such as the CFAN network, which is um, our center, I mean our climate finance uh, access network, which is focused on uh, really trying to mobilize bankable projects in ministries uh, within the different Caribbean islands. Uh, it's really looked at trying to push ahead about $600 million of financing for these island nations that really require money and capital the most. And similarly, we have the Energy Transition Academy that is also focused uh, on really trying to push ahead work in Africa, in the Caribbean, and now more recently in Southeast Asia around training of uh, officials and power uh, distribution companies around climate finance as well. Wow, that academy sounds really good. Uh, what would you like to add? Well, of course, we're grateful for the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister of India. Uh, and the impact created by the G20 here, the first uh, where the African Union was invited as a permanent chair, we see that as a win for the world. Uh, as we work across the globe, you know, we really treat the world as, as one family and uh, we welcome that, that guidance from, from the G20. Uh, you know, in launching climate finance around the world, uh, it's both similar and different. Uh, as you look at different regions. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we have sort of found is that our work in blended finance is, is quite interesting. The way we approach concessional capital, use that to de-risk projects and then invite the market in to, to invest uh, has made a significant change. Yeah. Most recently, we have something called our funds-based approach. So we have funds that have sort of two entities to them. One is a project preparation facility where we go in with concessional money and de-risk projects through the feasibility studies, the market analysis, the site mapping, and then we invite in private sector, the private sector through an investment fund to come and take over those projects. Uh, we have had considerable support both from bilateral governments and private investors uh, in this initiative. Uh, it's taking, taken off in the Caribbean and islands. Uh, we're replicating it in Africa and Southeast Asia now. And it's just one of the many ways we're being able to impact and catalyze climate finance in the world today. Well, clearly, I mean, like we have RMI who's pushing in funds, and of course, there are other agencies as well who are joining in. But how do you think, Vikram, that countries in the global south can ensure that this climate finance is uh, driven towards the correct projects that, you know, that attribute to their personal specific growth while contributing to sustainable development? Absolutely. We are in these countries, we are in these geographies in servants, service to their leaders. We're not picking these projects. You know, local leaders, government and civil society, choose to prioritize which areas, which sectors they would like to work on for their own economic benefit. And we are there through our 40 years, 40 plus years of experience to support those projects and match those projects to funding provided that good technical work has been done to the global best standard, which is what RMI stands for. That's actually a very good approach that uh, let them decide their priorities and then plan accordingly. Uh, but Ria, how do you think this, uh, that climate finance is also leading to uh, women empowerment, livelihoods, better job creation? How do you think that it's adding as well? well thank you for that question. I think uh, the answer to, to it is a work in progress. Uh, certainly, uh, there's a lot of optimism, I would say, about the new opportunities that are emerging from climate sectors. You know, if you, for instance, look at uh, the changes that are happening, there are new sectors that are becoming more relevant, uh, that are requiring different skills that you need more training for, for instance, or these are areas where you could see maybe more women participating mm -hmm. as well, right? Mm -hmm. For instance, if you look at the mobility sector, uh -huh. um, and sharing a very small example of this, uh, so with the ability to charge your electric vehicle at home, uh, 
uh, rather than going to a petrol pump, for instance, has enabled a lot of women to feel secure about using their mode of transport yes. to get out of their homes and go and do the work that they would want to do. Absolutely. Um, another example I'd share of the mobility sector that we're seeing, um, so this company, they're running auto rickshaws uh, in the Delhi NCR region. Mm -hmm. They got funding to grow their project and to you know, really support uh, more women as auto drivers, which was very unique about this because it's traditionally a job that's seen and that's done by men. But having more women in last mile mobility using electric vehicles not just enables and empowers their livelihoods as drivers, but also makes just travel a lot more comfortable for a lot more women in this space. So that's just an example from the mobility sector. But I think more broadly, if you look at the space, uh, getting climate finance towards you know these emerging sectors and opportunities, some of these are highly technical areas, uh, very heavy focused on manufacturing, like green hydrogen, for instance, um, is one of those areas. Uh, or opportunities in hard to abate sectors like green steel, etc., require very specific technical skill and know how. So, upskilling for that, uh, being a part of the new manufacturing setups will, that will be put in place uh, is really where there is opportunity. Uh, but also on the other end, I think there's a recognition that women, for instance, will be facing the brunt, for instance, of climate change a lot more compared to a lot of their other. Uh, you know, counterparts to our men counterparts. And I think initiatives are in place where there's a lot of conversation around just transition as a concept. So truly trying to ensure that no one is left behind as we transition uh, towards these new and climate aligned sectors. We have women as an integral part of it and we embed that right at the very start of whatever financing is happening to these projects. Can we embed uh, those components of just transition and focus on women um, and societies that are going to be impacted in place right at the beginning. Um, so I would say that these are fairly critical areas where we see the opportunity coming from climate finance flows towards these new emerging sectors. You know, I remember some years back, um, I was reading a report and it said that many times when uh, the, the research is being done, when the data is being collected, women often get ignored as the farmers on the field. They often get ignored, so nobody counts them as farmers. Uh, the opinions are not heard, but listening to the examples you shared, it's almost like women were at the center while uh, thinking of these new ideas of going forward. So I absolutely, I, I love the uh, examples that you shared. Vikram, would like to say something? The finance that we work on is not only just climate finance, it's climate and inclusive finance. Uh, you know, we are helping to unleash the economic power of these countries, of disadvantaged people, uh, and looking th towards all sectors of society to make sure that it's holistic and that it's really owned by you know, the constituents on the ground, and that's important to our work. Yes, I, I think it shows by what uh, examples you've shared, really wonderful. Uh, with that, I also want to know, Ikram, RMI's vision and role as part of uh, Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. Oh, we're so grateful to be a part of the alliance. Uh, you know, the, from, from our CEO on down, we are very proud of our, our role as a strategic implementing partner of the alliance. We have been supporting this initiative back when it was called Rockefeller XPX, uh, since then, we've welcomed the generous support of the Bezos, Bezos Earth Fund uh, and, of course, the IKEA Foundation. Uh, we've been there from the very start, initially starting out in this simple grantor-grantee model, but now we've shifted into an exciting sort of partnership role where we're uh, collaborating and launching innovative partnerships, particularly around global utility innovation. Uh, and I mentioned, of course, the report that we're launching today from zero to 40 gigawatts in India within seven years. It's ambitious but we're clearly showing that it's possible, uh, not only in India, but around the world. Well, the world is looking forward to that for sure. Uh, thank you so much for your insights. Now, before I leave both of you, I have to ask you one question. Where do you see the world in the next five years? Rie? Yes, um, a very good question, I'd say. Um, I think where I would want to see the world in the next five years is, um, a place where we've sort of eliminated uh, vehicles which are run on petrol or diesel. That would be my desire or wish. Um, I think uh, 
you know, there's so much of momentum towards electrification of vehicles that we're seeing, I think, in five years, if we have accelerated efforts and uh, with the support that, you know, governments uh, specifically, for instance, in India, putting towards these kind of missions, um, with their support and blessing, I think things like this could be possible. Um, and maybe a very specific hope, if I were to say, is, uh, you know, we have cleaner air as a result of it. Yes. Uh, we're facing a lot of issues around air pollution as well. So how can we use some of the tools that, you know, we've learned uh, that can help combat uh, pollution and, you know, help sort of uh, abate the climate change curve? How can we really try and use those to yes. take it ahead? That's, I, I love the answer. Thank you, Ria. And Vikram, what about you? You know, this uh, it really isn't just about climate for me. This is about economic development. And the demographics speak for themselves. Uh, you know, India is a very young society, uh, now the world's most populous. Africa, not, not too far behind. We want to unleash human talent. We want to unleash economic growth and allow that to happen responsibly. Is it possible to grow, to set an example for the world, uh, to achieve these growth targets, ambitious growth targets, uh, while doing you know, minimal da damage to the environment. And we certainly believe that's possible. India will soon be the third largest economy in the world. Uh, and if we can use this as a model to showcase uh, best in technology efforts, best class innovation, uh, that will say something for generations to come. Yes, and that's absolutely a dream that we're all, uh, we're behind you for that too, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much, Ria. Thank you so much, Vikram, for joining us today. We loved having you on Flip the Switch. And thank you so much for listening to us. Keep coming back for more episodes. Show some love and let's change energy. If you want to watch the full video, that is available on energyalliance.org.